whether by accident or by design, they made it. A pivotal moment in our history. The quantum leap in our thinking strikes again. Modern man's ability to imagine a world beyond his horizons had taken him to the other side of the world. Although we have no direct evidence for the methods used by these coastal migrants to reach Australia, reach it they did by around 50,000 years ago. And we have a clear genetic trail leading out of Africa along the entire route. But that only accounts for around 10% of the world's population. The other 90% took a different route, and that's where we're headed next. The descendants of this second wave of explorers would become Europeans, Asians, and Native Americans. The odds of survival were close to zero. How did they make it? How will I ever make it? So far, we've revealed how the very first people to leave Africa had made it to Australia by 50,000 years ago. But what about the rest of the world? What was their journey? This fridge contains blood samples from populations scattered across the globe. Chinese, Russian, Native American, European, Indian, they're all represented here, and they share one thing in common. It's a marker inherited from a single man. We've discovered that this group was the second to strike out from Africa, and they took a different route to the Middle East. The Middle East, around 45,000 years ago, the bridge between Africa and the rest of the world. Makes sense. It's an obvious land route out of Africa. But why take it? The time when our ancestors left Africa was the middle of an ice age. Now, this doesn't mean there was a lot of ice in Africa. In fact, it was just a few degrees cooler in the tropics, and it was probably much more comfortable. <laughs> it's not as if they're suffering from cold. What they're suffering from is drought. What this does is to push all the animals and their predators in the Sahara out into North Africa, out into the Middle East. And from here, they were poised to launch themselves on the rest of the world. So where next? The genetic markers show that one branch from the Middle East made its way swiftly into India. This small group traveling down into India from the north was so successful that their numbers quickly multiplied. They soon swamped nearly all traces of the previous coastal migration. A second wave headed for China. Here, bounded by sea and mountains, they remained in isolation, developing a distinctive appearance they were also to become the largest nation on Earth. But the genetics reveal more. It appears that East Asia was settled by two waves of migration, one going to the north and one going to the south of these mountain ranges, a bit like an ancient genetic pincher movement, still visible in the blood of the people living there today. These were massive undertakings. In the virtual blink of an eye, mankind had reached as far afield as India and China. In comparison, it's only a short hop into Europe. You'd expect humans to have settled in there, too. But they hadn't. While humans were peopling Asia, in Europe, they were nowhere to be seen. I've always had a particular interest in this part of the world. The story gets a little more personal here, because although I'm American, my ancestors originally came from Northern Europe. But how far back can we trace that ancestry? And in particular, who were the first Europeans? The archeology span tells us that it took them nearly 10,000 years to get here from the Middle East. I've always wondered why. In 
it turns out the answer lies underground. This is Peshmero, an enormous system of subterranean caves and tunnels in southern France, and home to a breathtaking array of priceless artwork. The artists were my own ancient ancestors, the first Europeans, also known as the Cro-Magnon people. Could these paintings be clues to their journey here? If anyone can help me work this out, it's archaeologist Michel Lorblanchet. He's made a lifelong study of these prehistoric painters. He explained that these ancient Europeans were the first cavemen with an artistic side. This is the first time that man draw in caves mm -hmm. with uh, beautiful animal drawings. This is the first time. Why do you think it begins at that time? Why? <laughs> Big question. <laughs> um, I believe that uh, at this time, uh, Cro-Magnon was uh, arriving. Uh, he was a newcomer uh, arriving uh, in this area. And he found, he discovered the cave first. And the cave became sort of a sanctuary. But if Europeans were newcomers, where had they come from? The paintings were like postcards from an ancient world of a journey. Michel explained that these picture postcards described a journey all right, a journey through the Ice Age. Mammoths, bison, wild horses, ibex, all roamed the frozen earth. But the Middle East wasn't frozen. Where had they been? Wherever they'd come from, they toughened up along the way. But I really couldn't believe what he showed me next. Bear scratches. No, the bear were spending the winter in the cave, mm. hibernating. You see, they had big clothes. Bears lived in here. These people must have been fearless. It was dangerous, yes, to to visit the cave from time to time. I think these people were just so incredibly inventive in the same way that we are today that they could, manu you know, they could manufacture what it took, new you know, make up houses, clothing, and things of this sort very quickly. Very quickly, it means in a geologic eye blink. Just as well, life must have been pretty brutal. I've seen the drawing on the, on the ceiling. The man who traced those figures, yeah. what would his life have been like? He was a hunter. He was a Actually, the term premeditated killer comes to mind. This guy had the strength, speed, and wit to hunt the giant mammoths in his paintings. Michel shows me how huge this guy would have to be to reach the ceiling. You see the back of the mammoth here, the head, the trunk, the front leg, yeah, the belly, but the hind quarter are missing because they are too far from the rock. So he was perched on that rock and yes. stretching. Yes, yeah. and it's quite a distance. That's true. Uh, in fact, this man was a very tall man. He was more than six feet high, six feet uh, tall. That's taller than the average French man today. Why? Richard Klein. Cro-Magnons arrived there with African body proportions, really adapted to much warmer conditions. When they arrived in Europe, it's interesting that their physical proportions are more sort of tropical African. They're long and kind of skinny. And that tells me that they had the cultural buffer, the clothing and the housing, that were the main thing that allowed them to adapt to very cold climates. But clothing and housing aside, anthropologist Nina Jablonski believes that Cro-Magnon had adapted in physical ways that suggested a colder, darker life. One of the greatest challenges in reconstructing the ancestry of humans is actually to put ourselves back in the time before humans started migrating all over the world. Because 